right, today I'm going to be doing a 5G NAR signal generation and analysis using the Roden Schwartz SMW 200A vector signal generator and FSW vector signal analyzer. For this measurement, I have the RF input and output connections connected with a 1 meter, 2.92 millimeter cable. And I have the trigger 1 connections connected via a BNC cable. Um, I'm going to be doing a 5G NAR measurement with four component carriers that are adjacently spaced, each 100 megahertz wide. I'm doing all this within the FR2 frequency range uh, at band N261 and 257, um, which is around 28 gigahertz. This is going to be a TDD signal using the uplink transmission. So I'm emulating the transmission from a cell phone that would be received by a base station. I'm going to be doing 120 kilohertz subcarrier spacing with 16 qualm modulation on each of those subcarriers. I'm also going to be using transform pre-coding, which enables more efficient uh, power range of the uh, inexpensive power amplifiers that are used on cell phones. Another word for transform pre-coding is the DFTS OFDM. Um, the transform pre-coding is the language that's used in the 3GPP standard. I'm also using RF phase compensation as well. Uh, so with that, I have the vector signal generator and vector signal analyzer starting from a preset here. And I'm going to configure the generator to 28 gigahertz at minus 10 dBm. Go ahead and turn that RF signal on. We can see that showing up on the spectrum analyzer. If I zoom in to 28 gigahertz and maybe look at 500 megahertz round, uh, we can see it's just a single CW tone. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and enable our 5G signal generation. We're going to change this to uplink and I'm doing a TDD signal in the FR2 frequency range deployment. I'm using 120 kilohertz subcarrier spacing and I'm using uh, 1 megahertz of channel bandwidth. If I want to see just a single channel at a time uh, with that transform pre-coding on and 16 qualm, then I can go ahead and apply those settings And when we turn that signal generation on, we can see we have some signal that's kind of coming and going, which would be typical for a TDD signal. And I could maybe do a max hold on this measurement using the RMS detector. Okay, so I have a signal that is about two divisions wide at 50 meg per division. It's about 100 megahertz or so. Um, but I'm more interested in doing four component carriers aggregated together. And I also want to do this um, with a slightly higher uh, repetition. So we have a symmetric channel. Uh, the first half of each subframe is going to be reserved for the downlinks and the, or sorry, the, the first. Um, five slots and the second five slots are reserved for uplink and downlink, uh, respectively. Okay, so we're generating that signal, and on the analyzer, I'm going to go ahead and clear the screen. Okay, and so now we have that max hold set up here, and we can see the, the spectrum growing. Maybe I'm not interested in a max hold though. Uh, maybe I want to do a clear write, um, and again we see that signal kind of coming and going through here. Um, I get add a trigger, and if I configure a gated trigger using the edge mode, if I start this trigger at maybe around 600 microseconds, or maybe 650 microseconds, and last for maybe about uh, 50 microseconds, then I'm only actually making that measurement when the uplink portion is turned on. And so what it's doing here is it's doing a partial sweep during that 32 milliseconds that it takes to do the complete sweep. And whenever the trigger condition is satisfied, it, it continues with that sweep and then it stops. All right, so there's, there's our measurement. Uh, if we wanted to do like an ACLR measurement on that, we could. Um, I'll set this according to the 5G NAR standard, and we have 
four transmit channels. We can look at the adjacent channel on either side. Now we're measuring around minus 16 dBm per carrier with a total of about minus 20 dBm RMS for all four carriers, which is consistent with what we have on the generator here, assuming minimal losses between the generator and the analyzer. If we wanted to demodulate each of these carriers, we can open up the 5GNR measurement application. And we'll go ahead and configure. We are in uplink mode with four carriers. We're in the FR2 frequency deployment. We're operating band N257 or band N261. And I don't need to compensate for the carrier leakage. Uh, more details on uh, that in a different video. Uh, I am using transform pre-coding, and I'm also using this phase compensation mode. So I have a total of four component carriers shown here. Each are 100 megahertz in bandwidth. Um, let's go ahead and set up the frequency. You can see it thinks that channel one starts at 28 gig, but that's not the case because the generator is uh, 28 gig is in between channel two and channel three in the, in the very middle. So we could apply it an offset and frequency onto either instrument, um, but re really we just need to have the frequencies match. So in the node configuration here, I have this 27.85060 gigahertz frequency on the generator. If I use this fixed component carrier offset, 27.850060 gigahertz, and the rest of the math should follow. 29.14997. So it looks like the math is actually a little bit off here, All right, so let's go ahead and configure the physical settings for component carrier one, and then we'll duplicate those settings across the rest of the carriers. So we'll go to the first bandwidth part on component carrier one. We are using 120 kilohertz subcarrier spacing with a normal cyclic prefix. We're using 64 resource blocks, not 66. Um, part of that is uh, the settings that we had chosen here. We have just 64 resource blocks for this transform pre-coding. Then we'll go ahead and configure slot zero. Um, we actually don't have slot zero in use. Uh, it's going to be starting at slot uh, five. So zero through four are going to be reserved for downlink. Um, but it's easiest to just go, go ahead and configure the very first slot and we'll duplicate it and, and uh, mark the allocations as unused later. We have 16 QAM. 64 resource blocks with no offset, right? So we have all 14 symbols for this normal cyclic prefix. And we have 3 dB relative power on the DMRS. We do not have a phase tracking reference signal. We have 0 dB relative power on the entire PUSCH allocation. We're going to go ahead and duplicate that a total of 10 times. We're going to turn off the first five, which are allocations reserved for downlink. And with that, we should be able to then take that configuration, save it to some settings file, and then we can go to component carrier two, and we can load that saved file. We can do the same for component carrier three. And we can do the same for component carrier four. Okay, 
And so remember, we do need to change that physical cell ID after copying those in. And we'll double check the frequency here. So when we loaded in those presets, it changed some of the values here. So we need to set those back. 27.850060 gig. And all the rest of the values match. All right. And one more thing. Final thing, we can change this table config so we can see all four EVMs at the same time. So that's going to change this table here. Let's go ahead and wait for one more measurement. All right, so I have an EVM of 15%. So we know that something maybe was not configured correctly. Um, and we can take a look at this graph here. We can see, oh, you know, it looks like there's some pretty high EVM. Uh, on the band edges. You know, is that just caused by adjacent channel interference or maybe is there something else set up? And we can see um, at best, you know, with the average, we're hitting somewhere around 3%. We, we expect maybe a little bit better than that. So what else could be wrong, right? We'll double check the settings. We have transform pre-coding and phase compensation turned on for all four of these. The frequencies match. We don't need to worry about handling that carrier leakage. Okay. And now we see the performance got significantly better. So um, it's, it's kind of coming and going. And, and this, this has something to do with the fact that we're not synchronized on the signal. Um, and so really we need to be making this measurement at the beginning of the frame. If we were to trigger using that external trigger that we had from before, then we're gonna start at the beginning of the frame and this should resolve a lot of the issues. Now we don't need to use any kind of gated trigger in this case here. We actually want to just measure the, the full radio frame, that 20 milliseconds long. And we can see that cleared up the measurement. It's around 1.3% EVM for the current signal that we have set up for the physical uplink shared channel 16 QAM allocation. And for the DMRS in particular, which is 3 dB higher than the, the USCH uh, as a whole, it's uh, 0 0.89 percent EVM. Uh, frequency offset here as well. The generator and the analyzer are not frequency locked. Um, you can get a bad synchronization if your frequency error is too high. Okay, when we look at the constellation, uh, we can see our red dots here. So this is our 16 qualm allocation. The green ring is a COSAC signal. Uh, that's a constant amplitude, zero autocorrelation signal. And uh, that is a, a PSK signal that is part of the transform pre-coding standard um, that allows us to be able to demodulate the signal. Um, so this ring shape is, is normal for that. Okay, so here's the allocation. If we wanted to maybe change this view to show us maybe the EVM versus um, the symbol and carrier. Go ahead and let that measurement refresh. All right. So we can see we have very low EVMs and we don't have any particular uh, resource elements within this grid that are high EVM. If I added a CW interferer, uh, if I added uh, some kind of in-band or, or near-band uh, interfere, um, you know, maybe I could cause a uh, stripe of these to have issues. Um, so maybe we could do that. On the generator side, we could add a CW interfere that's offset, um, oh, maybe 20 megahertz, and that interfere we could have be at minus 10 dBm, so the same level as the rest of the signal. And if that signal is strong enough, it may even lose synchronization. All 
right? So we can see that interfere here on the spectrum. So EVM versus carrier, we would expect maybe some slightly higher um, EVMs, um, but we're actually only looking at component carrier one and component carrier two. And if we recall where that was, that was actually on component carrier three. So we can go ahead and change the views here. We can only view two at a time, otherwise that's just more information than can fit on the screen. We can change view two to look at component carrier three. And that's going to change this graph, right? So we can see that by having a single CW interferer, that actually made the EVM really high across the entire frequency range. So the, the vertical axis is the resource block or the frequency, and the x-axis is time. Uh, we can see that the demodulation on this is pretty much garbage. Um, and this is a interferer that is at the same level as the rest of the four carriers combined. Minus 10 dBm interferer with a uh, 30 dB carrier to interferer ratio. Right. So now we can see we have a very high EVM on just one of these subcarriers. And the rest of the EVM is higher than it should have been, um, but it's still demodulatable.